Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Okay, Ben, uh, I just wanted to welcome you to the show. I wanted to welcome uh, you to the audience as well. For those of you who don't know Ben, Ben has been a commentator and political thought leader in Canada on the conservative side for many years. I first met him on the Maxime Bernier campaign when we started a group chat called uh, Libertarian Libertarians and well, the first was Max Libertarians Bernier. and common sense conservatives. Yes, that's what we Maxime are now. Bernier. Exactly. Uh, and, so we've been on that chat for oh, it must be three years now. Yeah, yeah it and has so, been. Uh, as with you know, millennials of our, of our ilk, we <laughs> we tend to uh, congregate in chat groups and uh, Facebook groups and Instagram groups and Twitter threads. We and hide our light under a bushel. <laughs> we do. We hide our light under a bushel. So uh, so Ben uh, has many degrees. I'll let him speak to the efficacy of those degrees. But he, uh, he has been to Harvard, Princeton, uh, and has a JD MBA from the University of Toronto. Uh, so welcome, Ben. What do you love about Canada? What do I love about Canada? Very occasionally, I I get very frustrated with Canada, but I'm a I'm a dual Canadian American citizen, and uh, and yet here I am. So I I voted with my feet. Yes, you could say. A lot of times, Canadians don't really understand their country until until they go somewhere else that there's a i think there's a line of kiplings in in his poem the english flag what do they know of england who only england know and it was in going abroad to do my undergrad and and then staying abroad for a a good chunk of my 20s that i really came to appreciate a lot of the qualities of canada because when i was growing up in toronto i mean what was Canada? Well, everything was Canada because that's just where I was. Um, I would say that there is a... Right now, we're going through a, a bit of a psychodrama in my in my second country to do with the elections. And there's a whole bunch of back and forth over, over elections uh, protocol. Did someone cheat? Who's doing the count? Can there even be such a thing as a fair count? And as with 20 years ago, when the last time there was an election psychodrama in the States, it is so foreign to me as a Canadian because I, I'm involved in politics here. And although conservatives occasionally have our go-arounds with Elections Canada, on Election Day itself, none of us doubt that there will be a count of the ballots and that that count will be, as far as can possibly be done, an honest accounting of what votes went down. And if it's close enough, there will be a recount. And if it gets closer still, there will be uh, something called a judicial recount, which I'm not quite sure what it is exactly, although it might be that we Shanghai our judges (laughs) and lock them in a room to do yet another recount. And by the end, there will be a result, and that result will reflect what actually happened in in the ballot booths. Do you think part of that is because Elections Canada is an arm's length organization, completely nonpartisan, whereas, whereas in the states, the governors make up their election rules, like the, the state legislatures make up their elector rules for the federal election? It, it could be, although I think the same confidence or lack thereof regarding officials' work exists in other fields like you i when i hear about my friends go arounds with american immigration or or so on that there isn't a confidence that the, the right thing will be done whereas as a canadian again i i have all sorts of uh disagreements with with our officials and and what they do and what the rules may be and so on but i have no doubt that when there is a rule there will be a good faith attempt to follow it. And if there is a bad apple, I will then uh, appeal for review, whether at the tribunal or judicial level, and eventually justice will be done. So what do you think it is about Canada that makes that a reality? That is a very good question. And that is, um, some of it I think does go back to our... um, our colonial heritage, that we, uh, we were uh, a, a member of the British Empire and, and uh, 
insisted on remaining such in the 1770s. And we were an active part of that until the whole thing kind of broke up uh, sometime towards the 1960s or 1970s. And there was a sense of, of fair play, of, of disinterested, uh, disinterested administration. Um, and people talk about uh, peace, order, and good government as being the Canadian equivalent of uh, the American life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whether that's true or not, what that also is, is that's just boilerplate from the colonial office in the 1860s. That That, that is what they would right. say <laughs> with regard to any institution they were setting up, whether it be the Parliament of Canada. They would say peace, order, and good government all the time. They would. Oh, there you and, go. And that is... <laughs> So we we do have a significant cultural heritage, and sometimes we forget that when we are are teaching our 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 young that we we don't remind people that Canada we keep talking of Canada as though it's a very very new thing, whereas actually the the order the way of things in Canada is somewhat older than a, a lot of the other countries that we compare ourselves to. Like, I would argue that uh, the structure of how Canada would engage with its its various peoples, including the First Nations, was set in 1763 with the Royal Proclamation. The structure of Canadian federalism was set in the compromise that uh, Sir Guy Carleton, well, Lord Dorchester, as he became, made with uh, the, the Quebecois seigneurial elite in the early 1770s that, you know, they would get to do their thing locally, but there would be certain things that would be across all British Canadian, British North American territory. And, uh, so those were two big things and, and that those very much define how Canada is governed. And, and we've been doing that since before the declaration of independence was even a thing. I, li- I really like this, and I want to dig deeper in it. So what do you think it is about British, let's say, uh, colonialism? Now, when we say that, we're talking about it more in a positive light of colonialism of ideas rather than a colonialism of kind of uh, hinterland versus core uh, spoken wheel situation. So what about the ideas here that are, as you've pointed out, British imper- imperial ideas? What about them philosophically makes them let's not say superior, but unique and special and, dare I say, you know, desirable in Canada? I would say it, it's the execution on it. And ev- every every country has the things that it wants to be in principle. And then in practice, they'll fall down on it. But uh, nevertheless, you know, the hypocrisy is, is the... Uh, is the compliment that uh, that bad people pay to to virtue, and um, I would say that just the idea that there should be rules and the rules should be at least attempted to be adhered to is is fundamental. And, and I mean, you can go back in pop culture. You can look at uh, in the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, Dudley Do Right, the Mountie. You can see the the cultural image of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. That's not to say they were doing that in real life, but the idea that they they would try and always get their man and 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 obey rules, and whereas in reality they were burning down barns. And there are a few Quebec separatists who died under mysterious circumstances overseas in the '60s and the '70s. And that's why CISA exists and the RCMP doesn't have control of that anymore. So there, there's, a, there's a bit of a, <laughs> right, a difference right. between the idea and the reality. However, when there is a, a, a lodestar that you look to, at, at the very least, you're trying to get there. And, um, and that's where I, I think Canada has, has pitched its flag. In that sense, I feel that in the last 50 years we have fallen down a little bit on, on educating people on, on what Canada has been and therefore have handicapped our little, ourselves a little bit in terms of where it, it can go and where it should go. Okay, well, let, let's give, it, give yourself, uh, I don't know, a two minutes. What is it that like, sets your heart on fire when you think about this country? Like, like gets you excited, something that, that is unique but also deeply personal for you? 
The trouble is, there isn't all that much that does set my heart on fire about Canada. But that's part of its virtue. That it, I just view it as a very decent place. That whenever I came home on vacation from college, or whenever I'm traveling overseas to uh, somewhat uh, less uh, orderly parts of the world, and I come back, there's always just a deep sense of relief in me at, at coming back, at going through the motions of going through customs and whatnot, saying whatever greetings that I, I, I say to the immigration and customs officers, and just picking up my stuff, tooling over to my car, and driving home. And I feel that, you know, I'm somewhere that makes sense. And Canada, even as much as we spend so much time agonizing over what we are and who we are and why aren't we like these other places, it's a place that just fundamentally you, you can just get on with life. And uh, even though we have a, a uh, larger government than I'd like, I don't feel, I'm, I'm not afraid when I'm dealing with the government. I'm not afraid of being misinterpreted. I'm not afraid that something that I say will be held against me. And, and I, I feel that there's just a presumption of good faith that is so relieving in, term, in comparison with dealing with the authorities in, in other parts of the world. I like that. There's a there's a sense of trust, public trust here. Yeah, there, I, I don't know if you would call it civic values, civic virtues, uh, social contract, what have you. But there's a feeling that you know at least we're going to try to make things work. And if we can't make things work immediately, that you know we'll do something sensible. Yeah, like so. so there's a, basically a solid foundation here with, on upon which to build a life. Whereas there's a lot of places other places in the world, many other places in the world where that foundation doesn't even exist. So, so where are you going to begin the process? Yeah. And some of it is somewhat historically based, I would say, that I mentioned uh, Carlton and the deal that he cut with the Quebecois, but there is another part, of, another history of Guy Carlton that I think is rather significant that just got dug out uh, a couple decades ago in terms of the popular culture's understanding. Um, and that is, uh, there was a little incident towards the end of the Revolutionary War when, uh, when the British Army was, and fleet were withdrawing from New York after the signing of the Treaty of Paris. And there was a provision in the Treaty of Paris uh, right at the end saying that uh, British forces would restore escaped slaves to their American owners. And uh, this is something that was actually very dear to the heart of some of those American revolutionaries that right, I know of. Right. There were at least three escaped slaves who belonged to George Washington himself. And the, I believe there was one who had belonged to Patrick Henry. There, were, there was one or two who had, been, who had escaped from Monticello, from Thomas Jefferson's estate, and so on. So this was something that was looked on at very high levels uh, on the American side as, as being important. And at this point, the British had already outlawed slavery, I believe, right? No, or they, no, they no. It, it was getting point. there. It, slavery had been outlawed in the United Kingdom, sort of, uh, by virtue of a court case in 1772. I think they would formally get around to outlawing it in 1808, and then it happened empire-wide in 1833. But at the time... It was, uh, it was something that was looked down upon, but was still technically legal. And, um, but anyway, Carlton was under orders to abide by the provisions of the treaty and extricate the, the army and the fleet and sail for Halifax. And he looked at this, and Washington, he and Washington met at Tappan Zee across the river in New Jersey. And Washington was like, well, you know, when am, when am I going to get my slaves back, essentially? And Carlton looked at it and said... And, and he phrased this very artfully, that he could not imagine that it was His Majesty's government's intention to give away something that they could not give away. That human, is to say, a, a man's freedom. And um, so even though there was that text in the treaty saying that, no, you have to restore it, Carlton came up with a, a solution that he would write down all the particulars of, of everyone who left with the British fleet and if he was wrong, 
then, as they were property, in theory, uh, the British government, London, could pay compensation for the loss of property. But, uh, but if he were right, then, you know, if he was right, then, well, they would have gotten away anyway, um, properly. And so that is what he did, that there's a, it's a document, it was compiled by, I believe, one of the, one of the outposts of the Association of United Empire Loyalists somewhere in eastern Ontario, or it might have been in Nova Scotia, but anyway, one of those chapters, and, and the document is, uh, there's one copy that the Americans have and one copy that's in the Canadian archives, it's called the Book of Negroes, and, uh, Lawrence Hill wrote a book that I think has now become a CBC miniseries. Yeah, I, I remember uh, when I was working at Canadian Heritage back in the, the glorious days of the Conservative administration, uh, we helped fund the creation of that series, I believe. Oh, oh very interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that that story is fundamentally a Canadian story, that the, the, the uh, bureaucrat or general or... I mean, uh, Carleton was the the once and future uh, governor of 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 Quebec and Ontario. Uh, he found a, a law that was, or a, a state of affairs that was fundamentally morally objectionable and could have led to a monstrous outcome. And he found a way to get around it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And then he he was confirmed uh, in in his view. He he was promoted and uh, given a peerage and all that. So obviously, uh, London well, wasn't too history upset has been very kind to him. I mean, we have uh, universities and streets named after him in Ottawa. We do. I I feel that his name should be known even further than it already is. That uh, I like. I like that you brought him up. That's a that's a great. Uh, as someone who loves history uh, as much as you do, and and I, I wouldn't say that I love it quite as much, but I am a big history buff myself. I think these are these are the stories that we should be telling, right? The, that that the, that Canada was founded on basic human decency, and I I think that there is a certain amount of continuity that way, and I know. In the news lately, Sir John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister, has taken a a good amount of criticism over uh over some policies of of his government especially uh, aboriginal policy and there's a lot that we have to apologize for in canada on that issue i i think that's going to be one of the major one of the major political issues of the next century in this country but the story is being told without historical context that Macdonald was actually on the the uh, pro native side of those arguments. That yes, yes. He, yeah. uh, when there was relief being given to uh, to people on the prairies, that relief was not available to the general uh, white so called population of, of the country. That was special relief for Aboriginals. MacDonald, uh, in the 1880s, when he was uh, pushing through uh, reform of the franchise, actually extended the federal vote to some status Indians, which was then reversed by Laurier. And it didn't, status Indians didn't get the vote again in Canada until Diefenbaker. And I think... Strange how conservatives seem to be the ones who are always giving these rights, and yet we're the ones that are always being called racist. Eh? Oh, sure. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, uh, you look at all the first. The first uh, female cabinet minister, the first black MP and first black cabinet minister, the first Muslim MP, the first uh, Chinese-Canadian MP, they all were part of the conservative uh, caucus in parliament, not... Uh, not the Liberal Caucus, and, and people, th there's a, a certain rewriting of history that uh, I, I really wonder about. It feels almost Orwellian sometimes. So in light of this, I guess if I could summarize it, what you love about Canada is, is that there is this kind of commitment to general decency. Yes, and, and I, I, I yeah. was, uh, if I sounded a little distracted a moment ago, I was trying to pull up this quote from Sir John A. Because I, I really wanted to read this into uh, yes, our yes. exchange here. And this is from 1885 when, 
as uh, had not been widely known until quite recently, Sir John A. Macdonald attempted to have Canada grant female suffrage. In the in 1800s. In, in or, 1885. Yeah, in 1885, yeah. And he, he said, uh, with respect to female suffrage, I can only say that personally, I am strongly convinced, and every year for many years I have been more strongly convinced of the justice of giving women otherwise qualified the suffrage. I had hoped that Canada would have the honor of first placing women in the position she is certain, eventually, after centuries of oppression, to obtain, of completely establishing her equality as a human being and as a member of society with man. It is merely a matter of time. Wow, I love that. Well, that's our first prime minister. Yes. And he sounds, frankly, like a feminist from the 1960s <laughs> in that speech, I, I would say. It's true, it's true. And so uh, when you are judging historical figures, I think you need to judge them in the context of their times. And our first prime minister, I would argue, was probably a century ahead of his time. Yeah. On, on a number of issues. And, and we have to, like, I think this idea of treating people as symbols as opposed to flawed individuals, right? Like, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Our first prime minister had his foibles, just as the first president of the United States did. But the, the and Ameri- we sure let people know a lot about that. I know. It seems to be more interesting for Canadians to talk about how bad our founding fathers were. Whereas at least in America, they still kind of honor the work that those people did. The, the intellectual architecture that was established to create a nation is, is no small feat. And one of the jokes my friends and I used to have back in university was that, you know, our country was created by a bunch of drunk people in Charlottetown. And that's, that's funny until you realize most, most political events are, are quite drunken affairs. But that doesn't mean that all the work happened at those political events, right? Well, political events, as, as you well know from your own experience uh, working in, in the front offices and the back offices, a lot of those meetings are ratifications of discussions and thoughts that people have been having for a considerable amount of time before that. And that meeting in Charlottetown, if, if you really think about it... It was more of a celebration. It, it was, but also it required quite a leap of imagination to say, okay, we're a, 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 just a whole bunch of random colonies that are kind of ruled by London and kind of left to flounder on our own. To say, okay, we're going to pull together and create a country. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a. I mean, now it seems inevitable. I, one thing I say to people all the time is, why do you think Canada is inevitable? It's not. It wasn't inevitable that be, it be created. That was done by the act of pe- imagination. I love that. Mm-hmm. It was an act of imagination, and its continued existence will require a continued act of imagination we as humans are creators we we create the world that we live in whether it's through building the infrastructure of cities um our houses our places of work these are constructed by the human imagination and the nation states that we live in are also constructed by almost a i would say a corporate imagination of what's possible and i guess that that segues very well from talking about one of the the things you love about canada to perhaps diagnosing what we could be and maybe what we should be. I feel that a significant part of our chattering class doesn't have as much confidence in Canada as they should. I I was a child in the 1980s, a teenager in the 1990s, and I remember when it was not assumed that Canada would would still be existing uh, 10 or 15 years after that that there are a number of books and articles that you can find from the early 1990s in the aftermath of the failures at Meech and Charlottetown and before we had our brush with death uh, in the Quebec referendum in in October 1995. And it seemed that Canada had to continue almost in spite of, uh, of our chattering class. And so I, I feel that Canada is both a little stronger and a little weaker than people think. Well, uh, as someone who's uh, read 
Russian literature and and done a lot of research on that, you you would have read uh, Tolstoy's Confessions, I imagine. I've uh, read a whole bunch of Tolstoy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, one of the things I love about what he talks about in there is he he has a discussion about the difference between the educated class, between kind of the you know the salon crowd versus you know the the peasantry as he calls them or or the you know the regular people and he talks about how those people just have a sense of let's call, let's call it common sense he calls it faith um they they just believe in the goodness of things and i love that you just brought up how canadians continued being canadian despite our chattering class it seems to be that there's a there's a disconnect between the idea the Canadians hold in their heart of what Canada is and what we're told it is. There's a, a definite divide. And I, although, although the, the, the people tend to keep uh, these things close to heart, uh, we do need to, to do a little better at the, uh, at the governance side of things in having some vision for where we can go and what we can be and what we should be. Because we are in, a very enviable position. I'd say we have the best head of state in the world in, in the Queen. We have uh, a very, very functional system uh, in uh, Westminster-style parliamentary democracy. We have whatever one wants to say about our officials. We have a relatively honest civil service that when it is tasked with doing things will actually do things. And we have a very well-educated population and uh, we're we're firmly part of the first world, and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't continue to hold this sort of position. And we we are we have a foot in so many circles that it, it doesn't even occur to us that other places do not. That we're when there's a G seven conference, we're there. When when there's a NATO conference, we're there. In the various international organizations. Uh, we are a, a, a strong member of the Commonwealth, of the Francophonie, of uh, a number of other th places. And we have, uh, as, as has most of the rest of the West, had some uh, demographic change in the last 40, 50 years. We now have deepened ties to other countries in, in those parts of the world, that we have very close ties to the Caribbean, to uh, Commonwealth countries and CARICOM. We have very close ties uh, to the subcontinent. When Modi became prime minister and when he visited uh, the greater Toronto area, he actually did a fundraiser for a Canadian politician who he had <laughs> yes. gotten close it's to true. across it's the true. years. And I do, not think, I do not think that the prime minister of India would, ha, has done that sort of thing in, in any other foreign country. But that's, uh, the reason is that I, I don't think he felt foreign here. No, that no, we, and we have these ties are real, they exist, and we we can't quite vocalize them sometimes, but if you look at them in practice, they're there, and so Canada, however self effacing we are from time to time we are we are there for all of these things and and as as kind of a network hub for uh for the countries of the world uh i I think we will have that role. And if we grow as we must, if we, at the end of the century, if there are 100 million Canadians, we will have a, a strong enough base to really mobilize these network ties. I love this idea of a network hub. I'd like you to like build that out a little bit. How, how do you see... So I'm a personally quite offended by Trudeau's claims that diversity is our strength because it takes away from the unity of the idea of being Canadian. But maybe... We, you can pull on this idea of being a network hub. Like, I don't, I don't want my intelligence insulted by the by Trudeau when he says diversity is strength. Diversity isn't strength. There's something else in diversity. There's something else in the diversity of Canadian culture that gives us strength despite our differences. Right. Well, I, I do think it goes back again to the 1760s and 1770s when we were cobbling ourselves together from the patchwork of, of British North America that was not rebelling against the crown and setting out on, on the path that the Republic to the south of us has. 
that um, we we figured out ways of of working together and of doing things practically with institutions that work and not really oppressing one group or another with unfortunately the exception of uh, lots of our aboriginal people which is something we're going to have to fix but um in that in that i would say diverse our strength doesn't come from diversity diversity comes from our strength people ah yes i like this this is good people move here because they like canada and I, I again, I, and this is where I, I again am, am going to run up against uh, some of the people who purport to speak for Canada. I've never heard of, of these deconstructionist narratives from any immigrant family. <laughs> yes, yes. That, uh, and in fact, in the sensibilities of, of our immigrant families, uh, my father is from Nepal. And Unfortunately, because Nepal has its own difficulties, or fortunately, it's fortunate for the receiving country, my, my paternal family, the, the young people of it, have scattered themselves around the world. So we have a, a French wing, an American wing, a Canadian wing, an English wing, an Australian wing. And when people are finding a place to live, they don't really think of Canada as that different from England or Australia, that we're all part of sort of the same family of countries. And they're comfortable with that, and they want to come and, and be a part of that. And, uh, and that's, I think, the, the nub of what I, what I would like Canada to understand, that we're pretty good. People want to be part of us. We should want them to be part of us, but we also should not genuflect before ideas from abroad either that people are coming here because they like us and and they want to be part of us and we we should encourage and let them become a part of us yeah it's i've always thought it's interesting that canada is the only western country that it left that the general population continues to embrace immigration and i i honestly credit um a lot of smart policy decisions on that front that have kind of allowed for a, one might argue, large level of immigration, particularly per capita, but with almost no uh, negative feelings. There are small groups of people who who are ne negative about immigration in our country, but by and large, it's, it is a, such an accepting country. I would argue that part of it is because our immigration policy is not based on illusions, that we are not basing our immigration primarily on something like family reunification. We are, in fact, ruthlessly looting talent from around the rest of the world. <laughs> Which I love. I'm saying, like, Canada, let's go Canada, right? Like, it, it, it's a very I want your best and your policy. brightest. Yeah, I want your best and your brightest. And, and because of that, our, our immigrants tend to be better educated than our native-born people because we're, we, we pick them. And we uh, and whether those people themselves are able to get jobs in uh, in their fields, too often they're not able to. But whatever happens, their children have that same cultural capital that comes from their parents, and so their children will join those professions, whether the parents manage to make it or not. And so we don't have nearly as much of a tendency towards. Uh, communal strife in, in that sense that that i i, I fear other countries uh, get themselves into well we notice this in france and in the uk and a number of other countries in which you know mass immigration has been occurring is they seem to be ghettoizing in a way we don't do here now i mean arguably there are neighborhoods that are are more uh, diversified than others, but I just don't get the feeling in Canada that that there are that many ghettos. It's, I think that there's an understanding that immigrants themselves don't want to be ghettoized. The the again, the sorts of people who we pick are self starters, are people who strike out on their own, and so. Well, that's why you will see, uh, I mean, I, I, that the highway rest stop that I stopped at, that it was run, uh, it looked like subcontinent immigrants. 
and so on. And so they they head out to Cambridge, Ontario, which is not the most uh, diverse place. But, right, uh, right. But I mean, uh, who cares? As long as you can come here and and do your thing, then that that's what actually matters. I was recently in uh, in the peace country in northern British Columbia for a campaign. And uh, almost all of the small business owners were people of Filipino descent. And I just love watching our country accept these people and and bring them into our culture. And and they just become Canadian. It, it was minus seven degrees at the end of September, October there. Oh, gosh. And uh, and we're still experiencing that. I guess it was October. Uh, but And they're experiencing that with us. They're sharing in this kind of canadiana idea of surviving the cold and 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 we're all embracing one another together and i just i get this impression that a lot of people think we need some kind of post post nationalistic state in which you know we're just this global citizen we're not canadian i don't think that's why people come here i think people come here for what canada has to offer well they want to be canadian that if you if you go to community gatherings, uh, often in the suburbs, you will see the most cheesy renditions of O Canada played that, as as someone born here, it kind of makes me wince a little bit <laughs> listening to them. However, the, the, the point is that people are, people are genuinely and sincerely standing up, their hands on their hearts, singing... Uh, and and that they are tremendously happy to be a part of it. And so... I I think we actually have something to learn from our from our immigrant population that uh they actually like Canada. They're they're very happy to be here. And uh and sometimes when when we talk ourselves down, uh that we could use a little bit more of that spirit. Okay, so more of that spirit, but in in the spirit of that spirit, let's say how would you project a vision of the future that people can grab a hold of and say, this is what I want my country to look like? So the, Because one of the things about loving something, maybe even loving yourself, is, is taking good care of it and, and making sure that it has opportunities in the future. If you love your children, if you, let's say you have children, uh, neither you or I do right now, but you know many people do. God willing, in a few <laughs> God years. God willing, exactly. Um, what do you, what do you envision the country that your children will grow up in? What, like, what, what are you going to create? What are you going to put your time into to make this country? What's your vision? What's your vision for Canada? I think, and especially the, the coming from a, a Northern country where, where we have a lot of shared adversity, I think we need to prioritize resiliency. And I feel that we've gotten ourselves into some policy rabbit holes where we overvalue the situation as it currently is and forget to prioritize outcomes over the means of getting there. And so in education, for instance, I'm, I'm a big fan of what they do out in Alberta, where uh, pretty much the funding follows the child. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are private schools. With also the Swedish model. Vouchers. A lot oh. of people don't talk about that, but like Sweden has used this model and their education outcomes have exploded. Yeah, As conservatives, we really need to talk about European-style health care and uh, Scandinavian-style education, incidentally. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, take your eyes off the U.S. That the U.S. is going to do whatever the heck the U.S. is going to do. Don't pay attention to that. To the behemoth, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, especially because there is such uh, an inferiority complex uh, among our, our elite compared with their American counterparts. Uh, look at look at our our peer other countries. But uh, the the point is that I I think. You know, the point of education policy is to educate as, uh, the children as best as possible, not to agonize over which vehicle would, would be better than the other. Uh, give people the flexibility to pick what works for them. Similarly for healthcare, similarly for any services that one can think of. What is the outcome you want? Okay. Now just figure out how to get there. And, um, and I think that... Uh, Especially my home province of Ontario, we uh, 
we are a lot less bold than than perhaps we should be. That there are a lot of very talented people and very talented enterprises here that are doing all sorts of things all across the world, and they have a hard time doing things right here at home. Yeah, that's always uh, I've, I've very frustrating. Come sure. across <laughs> that in the policy world, and and it is. And that I said right when we got started that I, I sometimes get infuriated by my country and that this is one of the qualities that is uh, one of those things that it's both endearing and infuriating. Um, but that being said, we are still we still provide the sorts of environments where those people and those enterprises can develop. So we, we have a lot to build off of. I want to so I want to touch on overregulation and the impact that that has on uh, stifling Canadian growth and how I think when you look at um, what Mulroney was trying to do with the GST, actually streamlining our taxation system, but like because there's the manufacturer's tax beforehand, um, but there's been or, or what Harper did through various deregulation policies, which were condemned by big government particularly environmentalists, claims of, you know, muzzling scientists. One of, one of the issues for the, the better life that we have immigrants coming to this country to look for is that they want to build something for the future, right? They want to they right. build a life. And I look at uh, the success that your father's had, the success that you've had. You know, the most successful people I know in Canada are children of immigrants. Like I look at, I have a friend named Andrew Abraham who his parents owned a restaurant. Now he owns an accounting firm, a finance company, and and is constantly building new companies. The guy's 34 years old. I have a friend who started kind of a dental empire in Alberta, you know, son of uh, subcontinent immigrants. He's, you know, 36 years old. I am so impressed by the quality of people coming through our immigration system. And yet we might be creating a regulatory uh, framework that is making it harder to compete on the global scale, harder to be entrepreneurial. What are your thoughts on that? It's definitely a problem. And it isn't something that's intentionally created by by our regulators, by, by our civil servants. So I, I want to weigh that out first. But I think it's that there is a certain risk-averse side to how Canadians go about their lives that uh, in many ways is a virtue, but it is very much uh, to our detriment in, in the regulatory sphere. And... It's kind of hard to get your head around. That's why I, I was just saying that uh, prioritizing outcomes over over processes is how I would want our people to think about it. Excuse me. Just no, I had a hiccup. Uh, but um, I think that we, we really, as we focus on that and as we – that we we really do need to focus on getting out of the way of of good and and well intentioned people and enterprises as as we move ahead, and uh, that there is a good chunk of it I think comes from people my age or a little older who saw how close Canada came to breaking up in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties or how close it seemed to come. Uh, and and they feel that they need to put a thumb on the scale to to please one region or 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 another group of people or or this linguistic group or that linguistic group, and and that is, I think Canada's stronger than that, and I I think that if if we want to seize this this wonderful future that is is very well within our grasp. Uh, that we're going to have to do that. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Okay, so to kind of close this off, um, you love the foundation what we've created. Yes. You see us building a Canada of 100 million people with people from all over the world being a network hub for global, not just global culture, global business. Um, yes. And, and, Give me like a two-minute summary of, of just what you think that looks like. 
I think we are going to want to leverage the ties that we already have. There is a movement out there for uh, restoring a few of the ties that we had with our closest family members, with uh, our peer countries like Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, especially in, in the aftermath of Brexit, to allow free movement of people among our four countries with nearly identical political institutions and the same head of state. And we already have that kind of movement at the top, that a Canadian was handed a British passport to go head up the Bank of England. Another Canadian true, was true. given a British passport and, and went up to head up the Royal Mail. And, uh, and the information commissioner who hauled Mark Zuckerberg into a parliamentary committee was a, a lady from BC who was their uh, information commissioner and who was hired away by, by the UK. Uh, the brother and sister-in-law of, of a friend of ours, uh, Grant Dingwall, you might know yes, him. Yes, yes, I know him Grant's well, yeah. brother and sister-in-law were officers in the Canadian military, and the Australians came to them and offered them commissions and passports. And, and they in went. 90 days, yeah. <laughs> in 90 days, they became Australian citizens. And so that is one network hub that I think we can restore. Minus do you want to mention the, the, the name days. of it? Kanzuk. Yes, there we That's go. That's the acronym, and I, I'm a strong proponent of that. But Kanzuk is just a start because we have all the cultural ties with the Caribbean. Canadian banks are very prominent in the Caribbean and in, in the former British West Indies, many of whom, again, have the same political institutions that we do and the same head of state. And we need to restore and deepen those ties. Similarly, um, as I was saying earlier, that uh, Prime Minister Modi felt comfortable coming to here to uh, the greater Toronto area and holding fundraisers for Canadian politicians. We are family with the largest democracy in the world, the Republic of India. And I think that we need to leverage that relationship as well and, uh, and really go to town with that. And, and there are, again, Commonwealth countries in, in Africa that are, are pulling out of uh, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, their troubles of early independence to really start prospering. I, I think uh, South Africa is going through a few challenges right now, but there, there are other countries. Kenya is doing very well. Uh, Tanzania. Tanzania is doing excellently. And we have... We have cultural and, and uh, familial ties with a, a lot of people over there, and we should be leveraging these relationships. I, I love that. I, I completely agree. I think that the future of Canada is not, not this um, kind of watered-down peacekeeping role, but almost this big brother role to... And by, by big brother, I don't mean the Orwellian <laughs> sense, obviously, but the, the familial sense. Yeah, this well, big brother role to some of these developing countries, this sibling role with the, the family that you described. Indeed. And you know what? I'm going to be honest. I think that the, uh, the UK has, still has a lot to teach us about how democracies can work. I'm so impressed by the transition of power from Boris, uh, or sorry, yeah, from, Bor from Theresa May to Boris. And, and how that was handled, and then how Boris crushed the kind of insane anti-Semitism of the labor movement that had, that had just corrupted the labor movement in the UK. I think we have a lot to learn about, not just as Canadians, but even as conservatives, about how governing for the people, what that looks like. And, and I mean, talk about a place where it started, the Magna Carta, the first freedoms given to the people in a sense i would say that this in this decade there's been a bit of a political dichotomy between sort of a rootless cosmopolitanism to use the, the stalinist term uh on on sort of what, what's popular on the left right now to a rather narrow uh, nationalism that has taken root among some on the right. And I think both of them are bad because what we need is we need a, a I guess I might call it a rooted cosmopolitanism, that we are, <laughs> we are who we are. We're Canadians. We have the, the past we have. We have the institutions we have, but we also are open to the world and we're going to get out there in the world. 
And we're going to have to, I think, especially as my American compatriots, uh, I'm an American citizen as well as a Canadian one, as they withdraw from the world, Canada is going to need to step up. We're going to need to invest in hard power that uh, if the U.S. Navy... Particularly in the North, yeah. If the U.S. Navy isn't going to be able to play the same role around the world because Washington doesn't want to, we need to, together with the Royal Navy, together with the Royal Australian Navy, together with the Republic of India Navy, we need to be able to keep peace on the high seas. That might mean a couple of carrier groups. And, you know, it, it, in our current mindset that, that that's kind of laughable. Could, could except, Canada have it? Is, except in is the past, it, we have. But, and also, is it that laughable if we have Kanzak? Because, what, okay, what if, you know, this is just me completely spitballing, but what if Australia does the LAVs, you know, the UK does, or sorry, Australia does the Air Force, uh, the UK does the LAVs and the, and the tanks, and we do the ships. I don't see why that, why not? Uh, there's no reason for us not to be able to do that. We should we should be marrying our procurement to uh, jumpstart our our economy in that way, right? Like we should be. Ju- what is more capitalist than the idea of comparative advantage? I I couldn't agree with you more. And but in order to do that, we need to get away from thinking of military procurement as a way of funneling contracts to various regions of the country. We need to look at the point yes. of military procurement being military procurement. <laughs> yes, yes. We need yes. to be ends focused on this. I agree. Uh, much like you said, outcome, outcome versus means. Yeah. And right. so we, there's a very real opportunity in front of us, and we just have to go there and take it. I, I love this, and I hope to have you back on the podcast to talk about this more. Thank you for uh, for joining us for one of our first episodes. Is Thanks there so anything else you'd uh, like to leave the, the listeners with? Just as uh, as the great Raptors executive from Nigeria, Masai Ujiri, said to Toronto fans uh, a year or two ago, believe in yourselves. Canadians, believe in yourselves. You can do this. You just have to believe you can and take some steps towards it. Oh, I love that. And one last pitch for Ben. Uh, he didn't mention it, but he did run for the Conservative Party of Canada in the riding of Toronto Centre. Not a winnable riding for the Conservatives, but as is usually the case in politics, sometimes you have to sacrifice your own uh, yourself on the altar of the party. So you, you've done that. You've been through that process. Uh, what, what does the future hold for you? I'm currently working in policy for a minister in the provincial government, and that's a lot of fun. I think it'd also be a lot of fun to serve in the federal parliament, and I might be looking for a riding where that would be realistic for a conservative to win. Well, you know that uh, I'll be there every step of the way to help you. Thank you, sir. All right. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The Cad Story. That's The C-A-D Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.